at Harvard University's uh, Kennedy School of Government. And it's my distinct pleasure really to moderate this conversation. Uh, today's topic is uh, the Middle East in an era of great power competition. And you know, if we're gonna talk about great power competition, you need some great minds. You need some heavy intellectual firepower. And that's exactly what we have in uh, Posen and Walt, uh, two of the most insightful and thoughtful strategic thinkers that we have in the country. Uh, this should be a good conversation. And I wanna thank both of you, um, Barry and Steve, um, for making the time in your uh, very busy schedules. A uh, quick administrative note before I forget. Um, for those of you watching or listening, uh, as, as we're having this conversation, if you do have questions for either Barry or Steve, um, just write them down in the Q&A uh, uh, button. And what I'll do in the last few minutes is um, I'll pick some and then uh, make sure to invite the speakers uh, to answer them. Uh, so with that, uh, Barry Posen and uh, Steve Walt really no, don't need any introductions. Um, but if you'd like to know more about the backgrounds, their accomplishments, uh, I think that if you click on their names on the uh, MEI website, I think that will automatically direct you uh, to the um, profiles that they have on their respective uh, institutions. But what I am a little bit curious about, uh, Barry, Steve, I think some of the people logged in also would be interested in this. Uh, just tell us what research projects you're currently working on, uh, what classes are you teaching? We'll start with you, Barry. Well, I'm presently teaching a course on the US military power, which is basically a general literacy course on how the military works, uh, which I do for both graduate students and undergraduates. Uh, and it's not so much about processes and bureaucracies, it's really about force and how force is used and how it's been used in the, in the past. From the point of view of my own research, uh, aside from you know continuing to flog uh, alternative uh, views on foreign policy, which I've been doing for some years, uh, I've been noodling around with a, a kind of a theoretical paper for some time on uh, how I see the structure of international politics today. Uh, so it's embedded in kind of realist IR theory and nuclear revolution theory. Uh, to try and just develop a kind of a, a, a basic conceptual framework for looking at where I think international politics is going from a security point of view. Okay, Steve. Uh, as for me, I'm teaching two classes this semester, uh, both of them online. Uh, one is essentially an overview of international relations for graduate students at the Kennedy School. It's called International and Global Affairs, Concepts and Applications, which tries to show what international relations theory has to say about a lot of different policy uh, issues. And I'm also teaching a seminar at the Kennedy School called Realism in International Relations, which is a survey of realist theory that really starts with Thucydides and then runs up through a lot of classical political theory into the 20th century with E.H. You know, e. Carr, Hans Morgenthau, Ken Waltz, uh, John Mearsheimer, they get to read some Barry Posen in there too. Um, and that's actually turns out to be a lot of fun. Uh, in terms of my own uh, research, you know, as uh, people probably know, I do write a weekly column for Foreign Policy Magazine, and I do that every week. Uh, and I'm contemplating a couple of different uh, book projects right now for the next year or so. Uh, one, a book on sort of why it would be useful for more people to think like realists. Uh, and then also a book on trying to figure out exactly how the world really works right now. Uh, and that I may be putting a little bit on hold because the world is going through a really interesting period right now and how the world worked pre-COVID and how it works afterwards may be a little bit different. But those are the two main uh, intellectual projects I'm engaged in. Okay, okay. Uh, well, I'm very eager to start the conversation, but before I do that, um, I know that a lot of students are probably logged in and they want to hear from you. Uh, and um, I think this will be relevant to them. Um, you know, in this very challenging period now uh, where the students do not have the opportunity of interacting, you know, personally with their professors uh, and learning is happening online. Like what, what, what advice can you offer these students? I, I wish I had some great advice, but you know, I, I, I don't have much time to read anymore. Um, to actually just read books, uh, either new books that we hope will become classics or, or old books that were classics. Uh, I don't read enough history anymore. And I think back on when I started my career, uh, I used to spend a lot of time reading diplomatic history, a lot of time reading military history. And when I think about how my 
career went subsequently. I cruised on that early reading for a long, long time. So people are in a situation now where they have some time and uh, I suggest don't do as I do, which is spend too much time on you know, with my nose in the computer reading news stories. Do as I once did, which is which is read books, especially read books on diplomatic history. And there's a lot of great stuff out there, especially all the new literature that came out in 2014 on the origins of the First World War. Fantastic, fascinating literature, which everyone should really know quite a lot about if they're going to be in this business. Right. So read, read, read. Right. This is the time for it. Read, 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 but read, read diplomatic and military history. It's uh, it's yeah. good for your head and it gives you a lot of raw material for for thinking about both policy questions and theoretical questions. Yeah. Steve, any wise words from you? Yeah, Abed, well, I agree with everything Barry said, and I would add one other part to it, which is I actually think reading books is good for our mental health right now. Uh, spending our entire lives online, teaching online, doing office hours online, doing even conferences like this online is actually quite stressful for reasons I don't fully understand, although I've seen a couple of articles online explaining it. Um, I am now finding that if I can, you know, turn the computer off in the evening, put up, you know, pick up a book and just sit in a chair and read the book, that that's actually quite restful. And I think uh, students out there are dealing with an extraordinarily stressful period and anything they can do to sort of, you know, keep their uh, mental equilibrium uh, as solid as possible is uh, in their interest and in the interest of everyone around them too. Okay, fair enough. All right, um, let me get right into it. Uh, since we're talking about the great power competition and also the Middle East, I wanna start with the very concept of the great power competition. Uh, this is now the buzzword, okay, in US foreign policy discourse. Um, books have been written about it already. Um, it is all over the place in the US national security strategy and US national defense strategy. Um, and, and then you just wonder, uh, you know, what is really new about it? Uh, you know, as, as far as I can tell, geopolitical rivalries have been with us forever. China has been rising for quite some time and Russia has been a pain in the neck of the United States ever since the coming to power of Vladimir Putin. So what's the fuss all about? I mean, why is this a big deal? And just tell us, why is this new? I mean, how are you uh, reading this new concept? We'll start with you, Barry. Uh, well, you know, what's new? Uh, the fact that great powers are tilting with one another over power and influence is not new. What seems new to the Americans is really new because of how the Cold War ended. And the Cold War ended with the Americans as kind of, uh, not kind of, it was the greatest power in the world by a significant margin. And we got to call the shots for about a decade. Things went pretty much our way for about a decade. And we convinced ourselves, in part because it was such a comfortable period that it could last forever. And you know, Steve, since he's teaching a course in realism, will tell you why he never thought it would last forever. Um, but you know, it hasn't. And it, the way it's the way the way international politics has evolved is is a, a bit challenging for for for. Um, for people, even people who were around for the bipolar competition, because though the system is becoming competitive again, it's it's not. It doesn't look like the bipolar world. And uh, I use multipolarity as my heuristic. It's a challengeable heuristic, but I find it's useful for thinking about things. So, at minimum, it's right now it's a three-cornered kind of competition. Uh, it might be more than a three-cornered competition, four, five, six-cornered competition. Uh, so that's different, right? That you, that, that, that you have a multiplayer game. The second thing, which is not so different uh, from the Cold War, but it's different than it's in a multipolar, multipolar world, is that everybody's a nuclear power. And um, you don't have to have a very strong rationality assumption to guess that none of these states want to actually have a full-blown war with one another. So this exerts a kind of downward pressure on the competition. So the competition is kind of broad and shallow. Uh, a lot of uh, Sturm and Drang about small change. Uh, because this is all any of us do, it seems like big change to us. And because there's large institutions and bureaucracies with a stake in this competition, they're going to make a lot of it. Uh, but I, I just think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's real, but it's, it's not really wildly intense. And um, I'm not even sure it's wildly consequential. Okay, Steve? Now, I'd say a couple of things. I mean, first of all, I find it interesting that uh, reasonable IR scholars of different sorts don't even agree on exactly what sort of structure we're currently in. 
Uh, there are still some people claiming that it's still mostly a unipolar world, that the United States still has enormous advantages over the other major powers and are still kind of defending that view of the world. Others think we're now in a, a sort of bipolar structure with the United States and China, with Russia really being uh, very much in third place, maybe not even a full pole. And finally, a whole series of people who think we're in some kind of very lopsided multipolarity, where the United States is still the most powerful country, China somewhat behind but rising, and Russia very much in third place but strong enough in particular ways to be able to, uh, to cause trouble, at least in a, in a limited fashion. And you might throw another uh, country or two in there if you wanted to. So it is sort of striking to me how scholars, uh, even all scholars who say would call themselves realists, don't fully agree on what kind of a structure we're in. The second thing I think is interesting about this is I would characterize the Chinese and Russian positions as really quite different and their ambitions flowing from those positions as being uh, quite different. Uh, China, Russia, to me, is basically playing a very defensive game. Uh, they don't have great global ambitions at this stage. Uh, they're mostly trying to make sure that people don't ignore them. Uh, all the emphasis on being, on, you know, being respected, having a place at the table. Uh, and that's not surprising because the Russian economy is actually smaller than that of Italy. And it's pretty hard to be an ambitious global power with a very uh, limited uh, economic strength. So I think they've played a weak hand rather well, but with very modest goals in a number of different places. China is a different story. I think there what you see is a rising power that has uh, increasingly wants different aspects of the international system to reflect its interests. Most of those focusing around its immediate neighborhood in Asia, but in some other areas, uh, some broader inter international institutions, certainly in managing the relationship with the United States, uh, they see themselves as gaining more and more influence over time. Now, whether that means they want to someday supplant the United States as most powerful and influential country in the world, whether they see themselves as a model for others, that I think you know, is not going to really be determined for several more decades. But it seems to me if you're thinking about the competition between the United States, China, and Russia, you have to recognize that those two countries are really in very different circumstances and have very different goals. Uh, we'll have a chance to come back to, uh, I think, Russian and uh, Chinese ambitions, because once you have a good assessment of that, I think you'll have a better idea of how you want to proceed with the great power competition. Uh, but we'll get to that again, and I want to hear from Barry uh, uh, about this. But um, back to the great, great power competition, I mean, naturally, when you think of that, you also um, think of grand strategy, right? Uh, a term that you're both uh, well-versed in. Uh, there was... Um, an essay, I don't know if you had a chance to see it in the latest issue of the Foreign Affairs magazine about whether it's even feasible nowadays or is it worth it to actually formulate grand strategy in a world, as you described it, Steve, that's just so complicated to define, right? I mean, is it you know, unipolar, is it nonpolar, is it multipolar, right? And there's a ton of political divisions um, uh, within the great powers that might prohibit people officials from thinking long term and coming up with these grand strategies. Um, well, do you buy that argument? Let me ask you that. Or is it precisely because the world is so complicated that you actually need a grand strategy to simplify it? Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to see the article. You, you don't necessarily have to tie your answer to it. But just is this still a time that is still um, uh, apt for grand strategy thinking? Well, uh, I have read the article once rather quickly, and I'll need to go back and read it more carefully. But my initial reaction- Thank you, generally speaking. Uh, yeah, no, my, my initial reaction to it and to the general problem is sort of the old, the old line, you know, you may not be interested in grand strategy, but grand strategy is interested in you. Um, that there is, in fact, no substitute. Uh, you can't, I think, have, be a major power and rely purely on ad hocery. Uh, you know, dealing with one little problem here, dealing with another little problem there, and expect to be particularly successful because you'll end up uh, having a whole series of different uh, incremental adjustments, some of which will then be mutually contradictory. So even in a complicated world, even in a world where power may be diffusing, even in a world 
that has some discontinuities or nonlinearities in it in a variety of ways, you still have to figure out what do we think our core interests are and what do we think are the two or three steps that are most necessary to advance those particular interests. And if you throw up your hands and say it's just too hard to figure out any kind of overarching framework for our foreign policy, uh, you're likely to end up in worse shape than if you at least try to figure out what the major objectives are and then figure out what are the two or three uh, simple steps you can make to try and advance those being mindful of how others are likely to react to them. Barry, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, I don't think I could say it better than Steve, but I'll, I'll, I'll make one of my old dog observations. And the, the, the pendulum on grand strategy swings back and forth and it's swung back and forth many times in my lifetime between the argument that, you know, that Steve just made that you really, it's, it's very hard to live without it, um, whether you're a big country or a small one. And you'll find even that some of the smallest countries in the world, if their security situation is tough, they will have grand strategies. You know, during the Cold War, every four or five years, the Finns had a national defense plan. And at the beginning of their, their English language statement of that plan, which tells you something, uh, they would lay out a kind of political military means means chain, a set of priorities, a conceptual framework, and they had a grand strategy. So even the not so grand had grand strategies. At the same time, every eight or 10 years, some people will throw up their hands and you'll see a lot of learned academic articles telling you the grand strategy is impossible, our system's too pluralist, the world is too complicated. So this pendulum goes back and forth and back and forth. Uh, part of that is just that people need something to talk about. Uh, part of it is that uh, people have the wrong idea about what grand strategy is. It's not a cookbook. It's not a, you know, it's not a set of recipes. Uh, it's a conceptual framework. And that conceptual framework has to have a few things in it. And if you can get most of the senior people in administration playing from the same conceptual framework, I think you're going to find that administration on the whole is going to be more successful in its own terms. Whether it's successful in our terms is a different question, but more successful in its own terms than not. You know, this is one of Donald Trump's problems is that he has a kind of a no set of notions in his head, but they haven't sit that, sat down and worked out a conceptual framework. And he doesn't know if the people he hires agrees with him or not. Many of them don't. Right. So the, that's why it looks like they're, you know, caroming back and forth from one problem to the next. Because they, they don't really have a, a grand strategy and have, haven't tried to coordinate it. They have impulses. OK, so I guess that answers my question. Like, do, do you approve of the administration's shift? In grand strategy, I think we obviously have de-emphasized now countering terrorism around the world, and now we're, you know, focused on competing with the Russians and the Chinese. I mean, you I don't think that's that shift happened. at least conceptually. I don't think that's what's happened. Yeah, Steve has some words to say about it. So let Steve talk, and then I'll talk again. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't, I don't think there actually has been a, a really dramatic shift. There's certainly been an enormous shift in the style of American. Uh, foreign and military policy. Uh, Donald Trump talks about foreign policy in ways and behaves in ways that no president in our history has ever be behaved. Uh, but, you know, did the uh, Obama administration think of China as a long-term serious peer competitor? Absolutely. That's what the pivot or the rebalance to Asia was all about. Uh, did the Bush administration recognize that a rising China was a problem? Yes. In fact, they intended to focus very heavily on that until they got blown off course uh, by September uh, 11th. Uh, if you look at where the Trump administration is, you know, we've still got troops in NATO deterring Russia. We've still got troops in the Middle East, despite all of uh, Trump's statements that he doesn't want to do nation building and he wants to get out. We still have uh, troops in Afghanistan. In fact, he did exactly what Barack Obama did. He sent more troops there in his first year as president as well. So. Um, there's been certainly a huge change in style. There have been some changes on a few issues, but the overall sort of thrust of American foreign policy has actually changed rather less than many people believe because they uh, spend most of their time looking at Donald Trump's tweets or what he does at summit meetings and not at the actual substance of American policy. Okay. And you, you've already alluded to it, Steve. Uh, you started describing or assessing uh, Russian and Chinese ambitions and how those differ. Like I said before, I mean, a good starting point for, you know, proceeding effectively with a great power competition is understanding what these two countries are all about and what they're trying to do. 
So you started with that. Let me ask Barry to finish it, I guess. Um, just your own brief understanding assessment of what the Chinese want from the world and how is that different from what Moscow wants? Well, I think they're, they're, I think as Steve said, they're playing different hands. I think the Chinese have a much stronger hand to play. Um, I, I think it, in, in, an inter, in an interesting sense, I think the Chinese are more self-confident than the Russians, probably because they are more powerful. They certainly have a more diverse set of tools that they can use. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so they have a lot of uh, different irons in the fire. And I think the, their general purpose is what you expect from all great powers, which is to have first some influence over the, their geographic surroundings, and then some influence over how the world works, commensurate with their appraisal of their own power. Right? And since they're rising power, they want more influence. Uh, the Americans have been slow to grant that influence, but not entirely, you know, not, not entirely unwilling. Uh, the Russians are not the mess that they were after the Cold War collapse, but they have a much, a, a much shorter bankroll and a much more limited bankroll. So uh, if they want elbow room, they sort of have to wave uh, military forces around because that's the only strong suit they really have. It, it's even it's worse even than it was during the Cold War, where they could, at least at least for a time they had, ideology worked for them and the, the nationalist and anti-colonial movements worked for them. But none of that is really working for them now. So all Putin has really is his ability to either scare people or make trouble. That's and, and that's the cards he plays. And you know it remains to be seen how much influence you can you you can get from that. It's clear that you know you've gotten a little bit. Uh, not clear that he's going to get a lot more. Certainly made a lot of enemies, right? As the Chinese have done. So uh, I think both of them they want they want some elbow room. They want more influence. They have different cards to play. Uh, are they gigantic threats, or either of them, uh, you know, world and imperialists of some kind? I don't think that can be demonstrated. Is there is this a is this a true alliance? Uh, Maybe an alliance of convenience. Uh, that's about as much as I would say. Is this the world autocratic international? You know, some giant conspiracy of the anti-democrats with a well-worked-out system. I don't think there's any evidence to support that at all. It's a kind of convenient shorthand for people in the district to use uh, to try and mobilize, you know, you know, political support for an active foreign policy. But I don't think the evidence is there. Well, I mean, maybe not an alliance, but I think this is one of the questions that I'm getting from uh, the audience. I mean, uh, what is the likelihood of a, a little bit of a more serious partnership between the two, uh, regardless of what kind of systems they have? And I, we all know that they're both autocratic, but what are some of the areas or avenues where they can partner uh, that would be, you know, posing some problems for the United States? Uh, my, my view is to the extent that they partner, it's because we drive them together. They're not natural allies. People forget that, you know, they, they fought each other, you know, during the communist period, right? They actually had a serious fight and uh, with nuclear weapons lurking in the background, one of the very few such fights among nuclear powers that have occurred. Right. So do they concert action a bit? Yeah, they do. Uh, can they solve problems for each other? Problems that we, in fact, can create for both of them? Yes, they do. Uh, but the main thing that they each profit from is the fact that we seem to feel we're, we have to go up against both of them. And it's not clear that we have enough power and attention to go up against both of them all the time. So when we're preoccupied somewhere else with either one or the other of them or with our the subject of the rest of this meeting, which is the Middle East, uh, right. they have room to play, right? So uh, they do, I mean, it's true that they, they constant action, but it, is, is there anything here that looks like a real alliance yet? I, I'm not sure that that's what we see. It, it, I, there used to be this term alliance of convenience, and I think it's more like that. Okay, fair enough. Uh, well, I, thank you for the perfect segue, I guess. I mean, since we do Middle East 24-7 here, I think we have to start talking about the region. So, Steve, let me ask you this. Uh, how does the region fit in this uh, new concept of great power competition? I mean, how relevant is it still? You know, there's been a ton of commentary about the decreasing strategic relevance of the Middle East, but just overall, how does that region fit into the great power competition? 
Well, a couple of things. I mean, I, I think uh, what's to me is uh, surprising thus far is how little engaged China has been in the region. You know, one can tell a sort of deductive story that China, as it becomes more powerful and given its uh, reliance on outside energy supplies, would naturally be inclined to get more and more actively engaged in Middle East uh, Middle Eastern affairs, and you know, perhaps eventually try to compete with the United States for influence there at sort of the same level that the old Soviet Union did, where there really was a sort of serious uh, competition for influence throughout the Cold War. So I can make that sort of deductive case that that's likely to happen. What I'm struck by is how little of it has happened uh, thus far. Uh, you know, they buy some oil from Iran. Uh, there's some bits of cooperation there, but nothing that would look uh, particularly substantial. No one in Iran thinks China is going to suddenly come to their aid militarily if they get into trouble uh, with any of their neighbors. Uh, so China has been, I think, willing to have a rather detached uh, relationship towards the Middle East, quite possibly because they realize its strategic importance may actually be going down and because they've watched the American experience there for the last 20 plus years or so, and have seen this as an enormous quagmire where the United States has actually weakened its overall position by trying to manage, run, transform uh, the entire region. One could even argue that Beijing is playing a very sensible game here, which is to sort of let the United States continue to uh, expend resources in the Middle East to no good purpose uh, while it stays, uh, stays out. The Russian situation has been uh, somewhat uh, different because they have a modest degree of military power. They've been able to intervene in a couple of places with some effect, most notably in Syria. Uh, but again, I tend to view that as, uh, from an American perspective, a relatively modest thing. I mean, what have they gained? They've managed to keep uh, Bashar al-Assad in power. Syria is not a major strategic asset for anybody, and it's especially not much of an asset now that they've had a punishing, devastating civil war going on for more than a decade. So if you put that in the Russian win column, it's not much of a win uh, from any sort of larger strategic perspective. Um, we can talk a little bit more about uh, sort of the long-term strategic importance of the Middle East, but you know, I guess uh, of the three major powers we've been talking about, it's pretty hard to argue that the Chinese haven't played the Middle East best so far. Maybe Russia in a very limited way has played its weak hand well, and the country that really should be rethinking how it's handling the Middle East is the United States, which has been a series of setbacks at considerable cost for you know now more than two decades. I think few would disagree with you, Steve, that Syria per se is of little strategic significance, but as you get closer to the Eastern Mediterranean, which happens to be now rich in uh, hydrocarbons and natural gas, isn't that in itself strategically significant? Uh, not, as, not as much people as people might think. I mean, what we have now, and it's not just related to the current pandemic, what we have now is a glut of oil on world markets, right? Uh, you know, look at the recent price fall that's happened and recognize that countries like Venezuela are effectively offline. Libya is effectively offline. Iran can't trade most of its hydrocarbons. And Iraq is underproducing its potential as well. So there's actually an enormous amount of oil and gas out there uh, suggesting that you know, anything you might find in the Eastern Mediterranean is just not of any great strategic significance right now. Uh, I can understand that, country, uh, that states in the region worry about who's gonna control those ultimately, but that's not the sort of thing that should be driving a lot of American policy in the region, particularly given where oil mark energy markets are today. Okay. Uh very uh, obviously, the ideological conflict that we have with the Soviets is gone. Um, the Chinese are more wedded to the international market system more than us, uh, frankly. So uh, one of the questions I'm getting on the, from the audience is, why isn't it possible to have greater cooperation as opposed to competition with the Russians and the Chinese to stabilize the Middle East? To stabilize the Middle East? Right. Um, Easier said than done, I understand, but it's well. I, I, well, first of all, first of all, I think you know, part of the 
part of it is is that is what Steve suggested a minute ago. As far as China is concerned, I think they're almost too. I, I don't want. It's hard to know why they do what they do or don't do what they do. I, I'm not an expert on China, but um, the pattern seems to be that they do not want to be deeply involved there. Right? When the Chinese look at their problems, if you stand back and kind of look at some of the bigger kind of concepts that come out of China. With, you know, sort of analysts you're talking about, Belt and Road Initiative, or you look at Chinese finances or Chinese trade. Uh, the, the Chinese seem to be people who like a lot of options. The way they secure themselves is by, by, by having options. They want options to trade on land, options to move energy on land. They hold a lot of money, in, 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 a lot of their money in U.S. treasuries. Uh, we can make trouble for them if, by them holding the money in treasuries, but Treasuries are an easy thing to unload. It gives them a lot of flexibility because it's, the markets for U.S. Treasuries are deep and liquid compared to anything else, you know, even now, right? So they seem to like options. So the last thing I think they want to want to be a part of is any kind of you know architectural thinking about the Middle East or the Persian Gulf, right? The, the Russians, it's hard to say. Uh, um, uh, they, they, it's it's hard to, it's hard to cooperate with them because they seem to want even more influence over events than maybe their actual power, you know, should should allow them. Now, there are reasons why they're interested in the Middle East. Uh, they have a concern about Islamic fundamentalism. There are a lot of Muslims living in Russia, and they identify, fund, you know, fundamentalism, but from their point of view, originates in that part of the world as a real threat to them. The Russians are primary products producers. I mean, they're in the energy business, right? They're part of the, the, the cartel and the way it works, the way OPEC, the way it works, that 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 matters to the Russians. The only car the Russians have to play is sort of the destructive car. So it's hard to be in a cooperative venture if the main card you have to play is a kind of a wrecking crew card. Uh, so, you know, there's lots of reasons why it, it, it would be hard, even if the Americans thought they had a theory about how to organize something, even if the different per, different countries in the Middle East and, you know, let's play it, Shia, Sunni, um, Persian, Arab, uh, Israeli, Jewish. I mean, there's, this, is, this is a pretty vociferous part of the world. And the idea of trying to uh, generate an architecture for such a vociferous area, this is also kind of, you know, just to me, kind of uh, quixotic on the face of it. So uh, I don't think that uh, anything especially ambitious is really possible. Okay, well, I think you're touching on a question uh, and an important one um, asked by a uh, former uh, foreign affairs minister of Egypt, uh, who's a good friend, Nabil Fahmi. Nabil is asking, um, and former US ambassador to Egypt, um, he's asking, well, I mean, isn't it too traditional uh, to speak of you know, great powers in the Middle East when it's the regional powers who have you know, always had a greater impact on the security of the region than, you know, China, Russia, and the United States. So I guess it speaks a lot of what you were you just saying, uh, Barry. So Steve, any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I think that that was true for a long time, although certainly uh, through the Cold War, right, the United States and the Soviet Union had a pretty impressive impact on the balance of power in the region by providing uh, arms to various uh, patron or various client states. Uh, certainly that was pretty substantial in various ways. Uh, what's interesting, of course, is through the Cold War, neither the United States or the Soviet Union ever had large military contingents there. The Soviets had you know, 20,000 or so air defense troops in Egypt for a while. Uh, we never had large military forces there, uh, briefly in Lebanon in 58, uh, briefly in Lebanon again in 82, uh, but we didn't have the kinds of forces that we had subsequently uh, as well. And you could argue that it was kind of a balance of power game amongst various regional actors with the two superpowers, you know, standing a little bit aloof and then feeding their particular uh, partners. Um, today, I think it's a little bit different, right? The United States, as I've said before, you know, spent much of the last 20 years trying in various ways to reshape uh, the region. And, yeah, and you and it, it, when you you started off by asking, you know, what what would be uh, make it possible for China, Russia, and the United States to cooperate to stabilize the Middle East? I think we ought to recognize that the United States has not been trying to stabilize the Middle East for much of this period. 
And even today under Donald Trump, I think you could argue we're trying to destabilize Iran as much as we possibly can. So, you know, step one would be get the United States to decide, decide it wants to stabilize uh, the region and then see if you could get China and Russia to agree with that. I don't think uh, that's really going to happen because, as Barry said, the number of divisions within the Middle East now is uh is multiple and overlapping along all series, a whole series of dimensions. From an American perspective, you know, again, purely selfishly American perspective, that may not be so bad. Uh, you know, you could argue that the core objective of the United States really since 1945 is to make sure that no single hostile power controlled all of the Middle East, right? Well, the Middle East is about as divided as it has ever been, which means the likelihood that any outside power or any regional power could actually try to control it, exercise even informal hegemony over the region, I think is now uh, not in the cards at all. So the core strategic objective of the United States, namely keeping it politically divided, is easier to accomplish now than at any time in the last 50, 60, 70 years. Okay. Um... Uh, we had the same question about, you know, the likelihood of and, and the merits uh, of cooperation between us and the Chinese and the Russians. And I want to acknowledge Paul Salem, the president of Miali, who asked the same question, just so I don't get fired. Uh, <laughs> but um, why is there's, but there's, um, there's also been a lot of discussion about, you know, uh, and I, I'm sure you both have uh, uh, spoken about this a lot, uh, Barry, you've written a lot about it also uh, from a broader perspective, but now that we seems to be most interested in pursuing this great power competition, I mean, what kind of a strategy should we be actually pursuing in the Middle East to best serve this new pursuit? Well, I, you're asking me to kind of uh, uh, st strategize for a project of which I don't, don't entirely approve. How about uh, a restraint 2.0? <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, and how should we handle the region to best look? The main thing. The, the main thing. Chinese? Look. Look. If you take seriously the Chinese challenge, let's just call it a challenge to try and keep it. New. There's a challenge there because their power is rising, and they want more influence, and they're doing what great powers do when they get richer, which is they're buying more military power. So you can't simply ignore it, right? Something's happening there and we have to be alive and alert to it. We have to decide what it is, what we want to do. We have to acknowledge that as a challenger, China could be quite a tough one. Um, they're, uh, as, as I said before, I think they have a much more diverse set of power assets, certainly than modern Russia does, but the, than the Soviet Union ever did. The Soviet Union had some things that Russia doesn't have, which has had a better, I mean, that China doesn't have, had a better had a geographic position, right? It had an ideology to work with at least briefly but the chinese have a very good economy they have a good technology base they're learning to build very good weapons uh, they're you know they're 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 patient uh, they have money to invest right so it's 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 a big challenge so uh, you know you look at the united states which has many challenges at home and is going to have more because of you know the money we're borrowing and the uh, problem of unwinding the the, the effects of, of COVID. And you would say, you know, from a strategic point of view, what you have to do is set priorities more carefully. And you also have to play your cards more carefully. So, you know, if you look at the amount of money and life and energy the United States has spent trying to do whatever it's been trying to do in the Middle East for really 30 years now, and look, look at this, is, is this, is this game really been worth the candle, especially given these, you know, these other challenges, I'd say probably not. So the first thing to do is stop making mistakes in the Middle East. Stop trying to make yourself the final arbiter. Stop being everyone's paladin. Stop being at war all the time. I mean, this would be a very good thing to do, to, to if, you know, from the point of view of great power competition. Don't dull your lands. Yeah, right. Sorry, I interrupted. Keep, keep. Uh, no, no, I, I, I made my point. Okay. Steve. Best strategy for the Middle East so that we can better compete with the Russians and the Chinese? Well, uh, so I, as I said before, because the United States is primarily interested in sort of maintaining a balance of power or helping maintain a balance of power there, um, we don't have to be directly involved trying to manipulate the local politics of the region. 
Uh, we should be diplomatically engaged. We should retain the military capacity to influence events there if we have to, but we shouldn't be doing it unless it's absolutely necessary. And the only circumstances it, in which it would be absolutely necessary is if some country in the region seemed to be maybe trying to make some kind of bid for regional hegemony. So, you know, when Saddam Hussein went into Kuwait, that looked like it might be leading in a particular direction where he'd be too powerful, too influential. And I think it was the right move for the United States to help uh, throw him out of Kuwait and then uh, weaken Iraq in a variety of ways. It would, would have been a mistake to go to Baghdad in 92, and it was a mistake to go to Baghdad in 2003. The other difference, though, that would be a really a major change in American uh, policy in the Middle East would be to stop having special relations with some countries and no relations with some other countries. Right now, we kind of have special relationships with Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Israel, maybe Jordan. Um, and these are countries that can pretty much do whatever they want uh, without facing a whole lot of pressure from the United States. Uh, the kind of unconditional American backing. Meanwhile, we pretend that we're never going to talk to Iran, right? One of the differences is, of course, Russia and China talk to everybody, right? Uh, they talk to the Iranians, they talk to the Israelis, they talk to the Saudis, they talk to the Egyptians, and that's how you get influence. In fact, one of my little fantasies is the idea of, you know, Mike Pompeo flying off to Riyadh talking to the Saudis and telling the Saudis that his next stop is Tehran. And when he's in Tehran, he tells the Iranians that his next stop is Tel Aviv. And when he's in Tel Aviv, he says his next stop is Ankara. Right? That's how a country that is located 14,000 miles away maximizes its influence because each person he's talking to along the way has a reason to tell him something he wants to hear for fear that he might hear a better offer at his next stop. Right. We do the exact opposite. We talk to some countries, back them to the hilt, don't talk to the others, which means the former take us for granted and we have no influence with the latter. That's not, I think, a smart move from an American perspective. Well, I think you just implicitly or maybe explicitly defined the strategy as offshore balancing. Is that correct? That's, that's pretty much what I just said. Yes. Okay. Um, I mean, I think it worked reasonably well after the end of the Cold War, I mean, uh, Second World War, until, as you very well said yourself, Saddam Hussein decided to upset the regional status quo and invade Kuwait. Uh, so you want to go back to that? Uh, pretty much. And, and it's worth noting, when you're an offshore balancer, that doesn't mean you stay offshore under all circumstances. Right? All right. There are moments when offshore balancers go onshore because the balance of power is being threatened. Um, and that can sometimes involve some fine judgment. I think, uh, you know, the seizure of Kuwait in 1991 was a relatively easy, uh, easy case for that. There might be some trickier ones. But it, again, this gets back to our earlier discussion about grand strategy. You want to have some organizing concepts that then help you think through what are the circumstances under which we need to get involved, including getting involved militarily? What are the circumstances which we can stay out or only be involved diplomatically. You have to have some set of ideas that orchestrate how you think through those. And as I think is pretty clear, you know, Barry and I think we're far too inclined to think of military power as our first impulse rather than as our last resort. Okay, I mean, Barry, I'm gonna take a wild guess that you pretty much agree with the concept and the strategy, but just practically speaking, say you're in government and you have, now gotten a pretty solid consensus that this is the way to go. Practically speaking, how do you achieve it? I mean, do you start withdrawing militarily? Do you take out all the troops, most troops? Uh, how do you affect the defense posture in the region? Uh, just tell us a little bit like how it would happen in real life, a strategy of offshore balancing. Well, real life is really my stock of trade living here in scenic Cambridge, right? Abstractions are my stock and trade, um, but you know, to be a little more serious, uh, I scratch my head about the amount of military power the United States is basically committed to this part of the world, not just what's living there, which is, you know, not gigantic, but still big enough, but how much of the American defense effort is really geared towards this, right? And uh, 
uh, I, I think it, it should be much, much less. I mean, it may be that Steve and I have kind of a modest disagreement here because uh, uh, you know, keeping the Middle East divided, that presumes that there is a source of unity in the Middle East. And I think when you think about it, there is, I don't see any source of unity in the Middle East. I don't see a great empire in the making, whether it's of any of the Arab states, you know, two of the principal military powers in the Arab world were Iraq and Syria. They're, they're basically gone as military powers. Uh, Egypt is preoccupied with an insurgency. Uh, Iran hasn't modernized its conventional forces in a decade and a half, maybe, to, maybe longer than that. There, there is no obvious candidate for military hegemony in that region. So you know, it could be true that you call Steve's and my strategy off for balancing, but I, I just don't think it's, it's very hard. And it's not obvious to me who the threat to the balance actually is. So my very strong inclination is, is not just to pull our military power out of the region, but to, you know, for most of the client states we've accumulated to say, you know, you, 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 other than your self-inflicted wounds, you're a pretty secure state at this point. You manage your internals we are gone, right? And from the point of view of America's interests, the one thing that made this part of the world interesting was oil. And oil is not, a, not only is it not scarce, oil is a kind of a poison. And for the next 10 or 20 years or longer, Western Eastern, all advanced industrial societies should be trying to wean themselves off this poison. So it's, it shouldn't be the job of the American military to subsidize a low price for poison that comes from the Middle East. It, it, whatever price it has, if it rises, it's, it's good, right? Because people will use less of it. And that's in fact, from a climate change point of view, what we need. So I, I just think we need a whole reconceptualization of our interests in that part of the world. And I think when you do it, basically it just doesn't matter very much to us. Don't look now, Barry, but you're agreeing with uh, President Trump on the whole issue of free writing. Well, it wasn't just President, was President, President, President Trump talks a good game about free writing. He hasn't done very much about it. Fair enough. Uh, Steve, you mentioned a major country in the region. Obviously, that's Iran. Um, I think you would uh, you wouldn't uh, be surprised for me to hear that. But I I have a disagreement about whether we actually tried or were interested in talking to the Iranians. We have. There hasn't been much reciprocity, uh, and obviously, the Obama administration has done far more than any other. Uh, but let's just talk about Iran and. Um, take you back to September uh, earlier, the past few months, and uh, the attack against the critical infrastructure uh, against Saudi oil installations. Uh, a good bit of analysis has been uh, written about it, but I don't think enough. Since you mentioned that our two biggest objectives in the Middle East have always been, ever since the Carter Doctrine, obviously, is to prevent the rise of a hostile power and to prevent those types of attacks. So now that we've seen one, in such an unprecedented and major way. I mean, is that a turning point in the region? Uh, no, uh, it may. It was a. It was an important moment, I guess, but I don't think it's a, a turning point. The the problem is that that attack didn't just come out of nowhere, right? Okay. Uh, the the Trump administration, uh, you know, having torn up the JCPOA, uh, has basically declared economic war on Iran, and they've been pretty clear, not always, but pretty clear, that their goal here is regime change. Um, and not surprisingly, uh, the Iranian government doesn't like this particular idea. Um, they don't have many cards to play themselves. As Barry said, they're not very militarily capable, but they have a few assets. And they began very gradually a program of responding to this in basically ways of saying, look, if you want to inflict maximum pressure on us, we're going to start finding ways to cause you some pain or at least cause your friends in the region some pain. And that to me is what the attack on the Saudi oil facility was all about. That's why these rather carefully calibrated attacks on tankers uh, were all about uh, as well. This was Iran's way of saying, if you hurt us, we're going to look for ways to hurt you as well. And since then, of course, the United States has been trying to quote unquote reestablish 
a deterrent relationship that we helped destroy, and I might add, not very successfully. Uh, because again, given the, the structure of other conflicts in the region, there are various places that Iran can hit us back not in a big way, not as an existential threat to American security, to the safety and prosperity of Americans here at home, but to some of our friends in the region. Um, so again, it, it, is, it isn't a turning point. It's just the latest in a very counterproductive tit for tat between the United States and Iran that goes back a long way. And I might add where we have inflicted far more harm on Iran than Iran has ever inflicted on us. Right, whether you think of our support for Saddam Hussein during the Iran-Iraq war or any of the other things. Um, so again, I'm not defending uh, Iranian policy or the nature of the Iranian regime. But this relationship really does have to be seen in a somewhat more detached context. Okay, Barry, uh, you and Steve have graded a lot of papers. Um, how do you grade the handling of the Trump administrations uh, of the region? Thus far, and is it really? I mean, is it really any different? Uh, I mean, there seems to be a lot of creative disruption, and sure, we've seen things that are quite new, right? But I mean, thus far, I mean, what kind of a grade do you give it? Oh, it, 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 the question is, I guess, I mean, you grade them in my terms, and you grade them in, in in their terms. I mean, in my terms, it's it's like an F. But uh, you know, if you're a a, a a mainstream foreign policy analyst, uh, say from the Obama administration, you probably give them a you know a C minus or a D plus. Uh, what grade do they give themselves? I, I I have no idea, right? I mean, I it seems to me that you know that that. There's some there's some kind of funny things going on right now from the point of view of, of Trump's own policy. Uh, the fact that the Saudis were really in this uh, this oil tiff with the Russians, it's clear they were also going after American frackers. And American frackers are all from parts of the country that are big domestic supporters of Donald Trump. And the people who work in that industry are almost all surely supporters of Donald Trump. So here are the Saudis who were his great friends, who we basically covered for when they organized the murder of a of a of a of a Saudi journalist, a country that we offer to defend, that we fill up with military power, and the gratitude that they show Donald Trump for having done all these things for them is to basically really crush a key part of his constituency. Uh, this isn't even good policy from Trump's own strange point of view. So I don't think they can get good grades from anybody. Right on their Middle East policy. Okay. Well, I mean, Steve, is it enough? Yeah, you're not. You're not going to get a defense for me. I mean, first of all, as I've indicated before, I don't think American Middle East policy has been very successful under any of the past, uh, you know, say three or four presidents. You did say that, yeah. right? And and uh, and Trump hasn't changed it as much. We still have the same set of allies. If anything, he's just sort of doubled down with them. Uh, he did uh, walk away from the nuclear deal with Iran, but uh, you know the Obama administration, despite the right-wing talking points, was not a pro-Iranian uh, administration at all. It did a lot of uh, you know rather nasty things to Iran uh, along the way as well. So that's not a, a sea change in American uh, policy as well. I think the biggest uh, F I would give them is just how erratic uh, American policy has been uh, under Trump. Uh, whether it's you know pulling out of Syria, staying in Syria, uh, this business of uh, escalating against Iran and then not being willing to back up allies, then deciding we're going to send more more troops there. What worries me most, and I tend not to worry as much about reputation as some people do. What worries me most is that no one in the region has any idea what the United States is going to do. Uh, President Trump says he likes to be unpredictable. Um, this is actually not a good long-term diplomatic asset. You want, in certain circumstances, other countries to actually have some confidence they know what you're going to do and also that they know what you're not going to do. So I think he's actually undermined our influence simply because nobody has any idea what his next impulse is going to be. Barry, right, let's just assume Trump doesn't get a second term um, and we get a, say, Biden administration. Anything changes in U.S. policy towards the region? 
That's one of the questions from the audience. Yeah, the mood music is going to change. I mean, the you know, if if you go back a step, you know, uh, I, I wrote a piece in Foreign Affairs a year or so ago where I I, I called the strategy of the Trump administration illiberal hegemony. And I attribute to the most of the foreign policy established in the United States a strategy of liberal hegemony. If you look at what went away in the Middle East, is essentially all the trappings of a liberal foreign policy, you know, beliefs in multilateralism, beliefs in negotiations, uh, beliefs in the, you know, respect for the sovereignty of all countries. So you see whether it's the, it, it, you know, the, 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 their peace plan, their peace plan for the, is Israel and, and Palestine? It's it's pretty liberal plan. It just say, basically says Palestinians, you guys accept whatever it is we and the Israelis have cooked up for you. Uh, JCPOA, that's you know we're you know done with that. Uh, the flirtation with uh, being the godfathers or godmothers of uh, some sort of Kurdish liberal rump state in Syria. Nah, we don't really care about that, right? Oil, yeah, maybe we'll stay for that. So all of that patina of liberalism has really gone out of um, uh, the, the policy. And I'm sure in a Biden administration, they'll try and restore whatever they think our position in the Middle East is, but they'll go back to using some more liberal tools with the uh, you know, proviso that they'll also keep using all the other tools as well, the Marshall tools. Okay. Steve, that's another question um, that I see here. Um, I, I love the simple ones, but they, they really are the most difficult to answer. Why are we so, I think I got, I have an idea of where you're going to come uh, uh, on this. Why are we so obsessed with Iran? Oh my God, uh, that goes way back. I think that that uh, first of all, uh, you know, we uh, we felt humiliated when the Shah fell and when we had those hostages held. Uh, uh, second, uh, the Iranian government has had uh, both rhetorically and in times in terms of its policies various things that were at odds with interests we had uh, in the region. Uh, certainly, the hostility between Iran and Israel has fueled that uh, as well. And the groups that have been sort of most uh, fervent in pushing uh, the United States to take a confrontational policy towards Iran have a lot of influence here in the United States, whether it's APAC or FDD or some others. And then finally, uh, we don't have other constituents in the region pushing in the other direction, quite the contrary for their own strategic reasons, countries like Saudi Arabia, the UAE and others are worried about Iran, which does have a lot of latent power potential. So we hear from most of our close friends in the region and from important interest groups here in the United States, the same message that Iran is, you know, the, uh, the, is evil incarnate. And because we're not very good at thinking through our own interests uh, in a sensible way, that's tended to shape American policy for a long time. So that the various moments where the United States and Iran have tried to maybe unwind this particular spiral have never been capitalized upon sufficiently by us or for that matter by Iran as well. I think that's why we're still in this very counterproductive situation. That sounds pretty comprehensive. Barry, did you want to have any Add any thoughts on that? No, no. I think I think Steve pretty much. I mean, there's one other point, I guess. It, 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 it's not a major one. You know, when you strip it all away, it, I think in many respects, depending on how you draw the boundaries of the region, Iran is kind of the of all the powers in the region. Iran is inherently probably the greatest power in the region. And since for whatever reasons we decided we wanted to be the hegemon of the Gulf, it's natural for us to be at odds with the most the strongest state there. And the strongest state there is Iran. It's not. The other countries. It's not Turkey, is it? Well, I, the question: Turkey is not really a Gulf state. It's a Middle East state, yeah, sure, but it's not really a Gulf state. Uh, uh, I'm sort of uh, combining it to more Gulf. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, that makes sense. Um, okay, I've got a couple more questions because we're running out of time, and uh, I'm going to go back to the broader picture here. And uh, was it you, Barry, who said that you were working on a project about international order um, nowadays? Uh, structure, structure. It's not the go. same as order. There you go. Okay. <laughs> One of those fancy uh, IR terms. Uh, tell me uh, what kind of, well, I'm going to go back to order then. What kind of a world order should we expect or what kind of changes to the world order should we expect in this era now of 
COVID-19. I think Richard Haas and others have started talking about this, but any thoughts on that issue? That was one of the questions from uh, the audience. Well, I think it's pretty, I've been pretty modest about my inclination to make predictions about all those because, uh, you know, it's hard to know what theory really matters the most. It's hard to measure from this vantage point all the all the all the things that COVID will set in motions, and it's hard even to define what the various important outcomes are. So I think it's actually a it's a it's it's a bold activity to make these kinds of prognostications. I guess instead I'll say something else, which is um, I think most of the great powers are going to feel kind of weak over the next two, three, four, five years. Uh, and I think it's probably closer to five uh, when you start looking at both the medical problem and the economic problems. And I think we great powers, great powers that aren't confident, I think it's actually kind of a good place to be. You know, we were worried that all these countries were held this dynamism and we were going to go at one another hammer and tongs and peer competition. That rhetoric is going to stay. But I think every one of these great powers has problems to solve. Uh, and I think it's going to make them more cautious. It doesn't mean they're going to get along, really get along. There's going to be a new spirit of amity. But I think they're going, to, they're, they're going to not want the rivalries to go too far. Now, if I were a statesman with power, I would be looking to ask, is this maybe the last moment we have to think not about structure, which is a more, you know, an IR term of a certain kind, but to think about order, which is not my usual way of thinking. And do we want to stop and think for a second about whether we want an order that is simply an order of kind of, of hammer and, not hammer and tongs, but this kind of low grade perpetual great power competition with a combination of name calling and subversion and all the rest of this activity. Is this actually the world we prefer to live in? Or as statespersons in Russia or China, the United States, we want to stop and think for a second. Okay, we, we have a moment, because none of us are really feeling our oats right now. We have a moment to think through about whether or not there's some more cooperative way to manage things. And if that, that exists, it's not a, it's not, you know, because we're going to make it the UN or some international institution work. It's because Sometimes great powers have managed to cooperate to manage, you know, to, to organize security questions and whatnot. You know, they have go by different terms, concert, conference, whatever it is. Right? There's a moment here to stop and reconsider about whether or not we're going to just have, you know, playing garden variety, you know, late 19th, early 20th century great power multipolar competition. Is that is that the world we really want to live in? We could stop and think about it. We have a moment. Right. It'd be great to try and use the moment. Steve, we're not looking very good, are we? I mean, boy, has this exposed a lot of vulnerabilities, you know, things that are not working in the system. I mean, how bad is it for just international security? I mean, the most powerful country in the planet struggling like no other to try to contain this. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll, let me say two things. I'm, I'm going to be less reticent than Barry about making uh, wild predictions here. I mean, but as I, I wrote in Foreign Policy a couple of weeks ago, that this is a, a, a real blow to the aura of competence that the United States used to enjoy, where, uh, you know, countries could disagree with us, but they thought Americans actually knew how to do a lot of things and knew how to do them all pretty well. Uh, and I think that didn't begin with Donald Trump. You could argue that the damage has been done by other things in the past, uh, declining infrastructure, you name it, political partisanship. Uh, whatever, but this uh, response to COVID really makes us look like uh, stumble bumps. Like we really don't know what we're doing, uh, and it's an unfortunate to me, uh, you know, that this pandemic arrived when we had the least competent president in uh, American history in charge, and arguably also both incompetent and venal in some respects. And other countries are going to notice that. And so, you know, three to five years from now, my concern is we show up at a big international meeting and we have a program we want to sell and no one wants to listen to our advice because we don't look like a country that knows what it's doing. Um, as far as predictions where this is going to lead the world, I think there are three things that at least in the short to medium term are true. Uh, this will be a less open world because countries are putting up walls for all sorts of reasons now and therefore it's going to be less globalized. It's not going to be back to autarky or anything like that, but it's going to be a less globalized world for a while. Uh, it's going to be a less free world because 
uh, governments are seizing central control as they always do in emergencies in various ways. Some doing it sort of quite nakedly, sort of grabs for power like you've seen in Hungary. But I think that's going to happen uh, around the world. And some of those governments aren't going to give that power back, or aren't going to want to. So a less open world, a less free world, and then quite obviously a less prosperous world uh, because the economic damage here is going to last quite some time, particularly in parts of the world that aren't wealthy, where the damage is going to be, I think, even more extensive. So again, a world that's less free, less wealthy, and less open is where I think we're headed for the short to medium term. That's to be excited about. Um, well, this is a final question from the students. Um, since you mentioned that you're, uh, uh, you're recommending reading, 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 Barry. So what is it that you're reading right now? What book do you recommend? Same for you, Steve, and then we'll wrap it up. I read doctoral dissertations. <laughs> <laughs> so I, can't, uh, that's not true. I can't, I can't really comment. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. I spent a lot of time reading dissertations. I, I'm not sure what. Well, what, you said diplomatic history. So any book. I, well, I, I got deeply into World War One history a few years ago, some of the new, newer ones, and I really enjoyed that literature. Okay. No and, names in particular. All right, Steve, yeah, you do a better job. So um, just a couple of things. I, I'm about to read a doctoral dissertation of uh, one of uh, one of my students on the McKinley administration, uh, actually, and how it played a critical role in America's emergence as, as a world power. I'm really uh, looking forward to that one. And then, you know, a book that I read in the last year uh, that I uh, was really struck by and recommended, Daniel Immerwar's How to Hide an Empire. Uh, which is about sort of uh, the informal American empire. And there's a lot of really fascinating uh, information in there uh, about sort of America's footprint in the world over the last 40, 50 uh, years or more um, and well worth time. And it's also, it's a quite entertaining read as well. I should uh, make I, one I, point. I, I, you know, it took me two years to read it, but I, I think I've read 90% of Ron Chernow's biography of Ulysses S. Grant. And in the last four or five years, one of the things I also have done is started to read more about the Civil War. And uh, there, it's, it's, a, it's, it, it's a good period for Americans to return to now um, because of the divisions in our own country. Um, it's, it's instructive. Got it. Okay. I think Paige will be happy with that. Uh, Paige is asking that question. Okay. Well, um, thank you both so much. Uh, this was fun. Uh, obviously, there's so many other issues in the Middle East that I didn't get into. And frankly, I see 69 questions uh, from the audience. I, I, I do apologize. I wasn't able to get to all of them. Uh, but hey, let's do this again soon. We very much appreciate your time and uh, stay safe. And um, we'll be in touch soon. Take care, guys. Nice to you. Nice talking with you. Bye. Absolutely. Bye. Bye, everybody.